Christ alone My hope is found He is my light, my strength My song, this cornerstone This solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving seems My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone Flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on their cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. Just blood and Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand the sermon title this morning is walk in wisdom it's from Colossians chapter 4 verses 2 through 6 before we open we're going to go ahead and come before the Lord in prayer Lord we come before you today with the sole focus of offering you our praise and worship through the teaching of your word. And although this building is vacant, we ask that your presence would be here as your word is preached. Lord, we ask that you would press your living word into each of the saints who are viewing from their homes and that you would fill them with your presence, with your comfort, strength, assurance, and wisdom. Lord, we ask that you would magnify your son and that you would cause us to reflect on the glory of the cross. And that in this time of fear and uncertainty that is gripping our nation, that your church, your blessed bride, would be focused, intent, and resolved in our faith while resting in you as our only hope in life and death. Lord, you are worthy to be praised, and there is no other place that we would rather be than in your presence whether we're corporately gathered or temporarily separated from one another, we rest in the fact that you are our only hope. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this section of scripture that I'll be expositing today comes from Colossians chapter 4. And as a bit of a disclaimer up front, um, this text was not randomly chosen. I didn't thumb through scripture and find something that I thought would sit well today. Um, This church strives to be faithful in the exposition of scriptures. And I've been working through the book of Colossians with my small group since August time frame. And this was the next section of scripture that we were going to be teaching through. It made perfect sense that I was able to take that lesson and reshape it into a sermon for the instruction and edification of the whole church as well as my small group. And due to the fact that this text is near the conclusion of the letter, I'm going to offer a little bit of a a brief introduction so that you understand the context of the letter and Paul's purpose for writing it in his progression of thought as he's been building up in the previous three chapters. So the time frame of these events, as it all went down, began around the year of 60 AD. There was a pastor by the name of Epaphras who was leading a small church in the city of Colossae. He was frustrated and he was growing increasingly desperate and concerned for guidance as he was watching more and more of his church members falling victim to the false gospel that was being spread throughout the region. Epaphras didn't have many options. This was at a point in time in history where Christianity was only a few decades old. He didn't have a completed New Testament scripture that he could go to. He didn't have bookshelves full of theology books that he could look to for doctrine. Epaphras didn't have a network of pastor friends that he could go to and ask questions. He didn't have a a trusted seminary professor that he could call up and assure him that he wasn't going crazy. You see, Epaphras' concerns were not misplaced, and he was not overreacting. He knew very well that the fundamentals of the Christian faith were being compromised in his city. Now, looking back at this event, we can see with relative clarity that the problems that Epaphras was facing, he... He was in the midst of what we call the Colossian heresy. Epaphras was essentially face-to-face with the beginning of an early church heresy known as Gnosticism. And for those who are not familiar with Gnosticism, you can think of it as, as a hybrid blend of New Age spirituality mixed with Jewish legalism. Essentially, there was a group of false teachers who were misleading people, convincing them that they needed secret knowledge telling them that they needed to be obedient to the Old Testament laws, that they needed visions and the worship of angels, and they had to treat their bodies harshly. They were teaching them that these practices needed to be added to their Christian beliefs. In a nutshell, the Colossian heresy was a blend of philosophy, legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. It generated a perfect storm of confusion that left people not knowing which direction to go. They were asking themselves, am I saved by faith through Christ alone, or am I saved by these works? Which one is correct? In the end, this deception was taking people's eyes off of Christ and placing hope in everything but the gospel. Pure and simple, this was idolatry. So Epaphras was exasperated, and he was without any solid ideas on how to stop this cancer of false teachings from taking a stronghold in his city. So he goes for broke, and he throws a Hail Mary. He decides that his only option right now is to track down the Apostle Paul and seek his advice. However, there was a major problem with this plan. Paul was currently locked up in Rome in chains, in prison. And to make matters worse, Rome was over 1,500 miles away from Colossae. Yet this this distance didn't dissuade Epaphras. This pastor loved his church, and he would do anything that it took to shepherd his flock to truth, even if that meant that he would risk his life on this long journey to find the Apostle Paul. Now, once Epaphras arrived to Rome, we don't know the precise circumstances of how he made the connection with Paul. Um, 
What's interesting is Paul calls Epaphras a fellow prisoner in Christ in his letter to Philemon. So there's a good chance that Epaphras was also thrown into prison once he arrived at Rome. Regardless of how they met up, we can tell from the letter to the Colossians that Epaphras had reported everything to Paul that was transpiring in his city. And upon hearing this news, the Apostle Paul would have likely been surprised. From what we can tell, he didn't even know that this group of believers existed. Scripture doesn't provide us any indications that Paul even visited Colossae during any of his missionary journeys. Yet this didn't prevent him from taking action. He knew the problem was dire, and he was overcome with a sense of responsibility to shepherd this group of believers from afar. Paul realized, however, that he was personally powerless to impact immediate change because he was not only 1,500 miles away, but he was also under chains. So he did the only thing that he knew he could do to help the situation, and he went to his knees before God and pleaded with him to stop the advances of this heresy. Paul prayed fervently that these believers would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and that they would walk worthy of the Lord, and that they would bear fruit, and that they would please him in all respects. Not only did Paul pray for these believers, but in turn he answered many of his prayers in this letter that he wrote to them. So as Paul opens his epistle, he introduces himself in typical fashion, giving his apostolic credentials, and then he tells them all the ways that he's been praying for them since he first heard of their faith in Christ. And once he wraps up his prayer, he addresses the primary matters up front, diving right into the doctrine of Christ. Paul knew that the number one way to combat this heresy would be to establish correct doctrine as a measuring line for them to see where they had gone astray. Now, a general outline for Paul's argument follows this path. In the first chapter, Paul gives his introduction, he gives his prayer, and then he magnifies the supremacy, the preeminence, and the saving work of Christ. And then once he goes into the second chapter, Paul gets out a wrecking ball, and he strikes down the heretical teachings dealing with philosophy, legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. And once Paul arrives in the third chapter, he starts to build the believers up. He starts to build them up. The first thing he does is he lists off sins to be put off or sins to be cast away. And he instructs them to put on their new self that is being renewed into the image of God as they bring glory to him through their marriages, through their families, and through their workplaces. And then Paul's argument is really winding down as we land in the fourth chapter. Uh, he's, he's given them further guidance in verses 2 through 6, and then he transitions to his final greeting and his farewell address. And this is where we're going to be this morning in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Now, due to the short length of this text, I'm going to exposit it verse by verse, um, just going right through the scripture, allowing it to guide us, and I'm going to offer several points of application at the conclusion. So if you would, just please turn with me to Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. And we're going to pick it up with Paul's instructions. Colossians 4, verse 2, Paul says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Paul was communicating the fact that they should be dedicated, persistent, unrelenting in their prayers. He's essentially telling them to never stop praying. Paul's instruction to be devoted in prayer is just as meaningful today as it was back then. Now, I'm sure we've all experienced it, where we pray for a specific matter or a specific person for days or weeks or months, and then we eventually wither out. Truth be told, I think that we stop praying because God isn't answering our prayers fast enough, or we think that he's not answering them in the manner that we would like him to. At some point or another, just being honest with you, this is going to happen to all of us. It's easy for us to become discouraged. And this is exactly why Paul instructs them to continue steadfastly in prayer. I think that we forget as Christians the privilege that we have of prayer. 
We tend to forget that the act of prayer is one of the greatest blessings that God has bestowed upon us. Just think for a second about the power and the transcendence of God. The fact that God spoke everything into existence with the power of his word and how all things are held together in him and how he sustains everything in the universe to include the laws of physics that uphold order throughout this universe continually. Yet at the same time and at the same moment, God is interested in hearing the prayers of the saints. God is near to us. He's so near that he hears our prayers even when we don't know what we should be praying for. Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, where he said, The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Believers. As born-again Christians, as born-again believers in Christ, we have the very presence of God in us. We have the Holy Spirit ministering to us. He enables our prayers to go directly before the throne of grace without interference. There is no lack of bandwidth when it comes to the prayers of the saints going before Christ. With everything that is going on, with running this universe every second of every day, he still has the ability and the desire to hear our prayers. And so Paul instructs the Colossians to remain steadfast and to not undervalue the importance of communicating to God in prayer. The truth of the matter is, is the sovereign Lord, the creator of all things, has called us to be in prayer with no end. Charles Spurgeon once stated, listen to this quote. He said, some mercies are not given to us except an answer to importunate prayer. Now, that, that word's a word that we don't use very often today in our vernacular. Importunate means persistent to the point of being annoying. Spurgeon continues. He said, there, there are blessings which, like ripe fruit, drop into your hand the moment you touch the bough. But there are others which require you to shake the tree again and again until you make it rock with the vehemence of your exercise, for then only will the fruit fall down. God is calling us to be persistent in our prayers. Now Paul continues, and he instructs them to remain watchful with thanksgiving. The Greek word for watchful is Gregorio, and it literally means to stay alert, to give strict attention, and to be cautious. Now, Jesus used the same word the night of his betrayal and arrest when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and he returned to find Peter sleeping. Matthew records Jesus' comment when he said, Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, there seems to be a unique connection there between prayer and remaining watchful. This act of remaining watchful is a recognition of how weak our flesh is. It is an, an awareness of how easily we can be deceived and distracted and discouraged. Now, you may ask, well, what should I pray for then? I'll tell you, sometimes our prayers tend to focus primarily on our health and on difficult life situations. The longer that I've been ministering to people, the more prayer requests that I hear, 90% of them deal with those two things. There's nothing wrong to pray for that. There's nothing wrong. However, God may or may not answer these prayers. There are times when our suffering is a part of God's plan. There are times when God may use our suffering in our sanctification. God is not surprised by our struggles. He's not unaware of our needs. He's not disinterested in our plight. Yet where we go astray is when our prayers are more focused on our needs, what we need, than they are on his will and his kingdom and his glory and his praise. 
the primary focus of our prayers should be for the praise and worship of God, the confession of our sins, thanksgiving for all that he has done and all that he is doing, and finally, our needs, whatever, God's, whatever situation God has placed us in. Now, think for a second. Take an inventory of the focus of your prayers. And then listen to Paul's prayer request in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3 through 4. Paul states, At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how ought to speak. Now think for a second about Paul's situation. He's in a Roman prison. Now let's take a quick look at what Paul is not praying for. Paul's not praying to be let out of prison. For many of us, that is exactly what we'd be praying for. Relief from our afflictions. Paul isn't even praying for better conditions or better prison guards. Quite frankly, he doesn't care about these things in the grand scheme of God's will. Paul isn't praying for comfort or health or prosperity. We all know that Paul could have used those things, but that was not his focus. Paul is asking that God would open a door for the gospel. Paul wants to see the gospel spread like wildfire throughout the Roman Empire. He wants to see the gospel message to be set loose, unencumbered by his personal desires for comfort or freedom or prosperity. Paul's needs are not even important at this point because he wants the glory of Christ to be center stage. And he, he petitions the Colossians to pray for him, asking that God would open a door for the word. To declare the mystery of Christ. Paul wants to declare this message in whatever situation God places him in, even if that's in prison. Now, you may be asking yourself, what exactly is this mystery of Christ? The Greek word is mysterion. Paul has used that word at least 20 times during his epistle, so it must be important to him. Loosely defined, the Greek word mysterion refers to a hidden thing, to a secret, to a hidden purpose or the secret will of God. The mystery of Christ, best defined, is in fact the secret will of God. And it's referring to the unfolding plan of redemption leading up to the single most important event in human history where the Son of God would suffer and die to redeem his bride. There was a mystery revealed in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 over who the promised offspring of Eve would be that would crush the head of Satan. There was another mystery in Genesis chapters 12, 15, and 17 as to how exactly Abraham's offspring would bless all the nations of the world. And there was another mystery revealed in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16 over who would be the king that would sit on the Davidic throne for eternity. You see, God had revealed bits and pieces of this mystery throughout salvation history using types and shadows and prophecies that would all point to the Messiah, his beloved son, Jesus Christ, who would die for the sins of the world. This mystery had been hidden for ages and points to the sacrificial death of Christ. This was the message that landed the apostle Paul in prison. Yet even when he was in prison, he kept proclaiming the same message that landed him in chains. And now that Paul has kind of laid out his personal gospel-centered prayer request, he continues in verse 5, instructing the Colossians. And he says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Now the Greek word for walk is peripateo, and it's, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for the way a person conducts their life. Paul states to walk in wisdom, to conduct your life in wisdom. So what exactly is wisdom? 
generally speaking, loosely defined, wisdom is good sense, it's discernment, it's the ability to make sound decisions. I once heard a friend say during a sermon that wisdom is the right use of knowledge. There are a lot of people who have knowledge, yet the inability to apply that knowledge to their lives effectively renders it useless. In the context of Christianity, there are a lot of people that have a head full of theological knowledge, yet the inability to take their theology and apply it to their hearts also renders it useless. So Paul reminds the Colossians to walk in wisdom. How? He says, toward outsiders. The immediate context of this passage indicates that an outsider is anyone who is not in the church. These are the ones who are still dead in their trespasses and sins and have not come to saving faith in the gospel. So the main idea here is that walking in wisdom is to conduct our lives wisely before the unbelieving world around us. The immediate application we can quickly see in this text is that Christians are not called to live in isolation from the world. Times like these, with the coronavirus, social distancing being the latest buzzword, the prospect of separating from the world seems like an attractive option. And no matter how much I want to live in an isolated cabin in the mountains, or Mary wants to live in an isolated beach in Florida, surprise, God, God has this in Clarksville. Uh, no matter how much we want to be isolated, we're called to live in the world. We're called to live amongst the lost. We're called to allow the testimony of our lives and the words of our mouths to bring glory to God. Now the question is, is how do I walk in wisdom toward outsiders? Walking in wisdom implies that we strive for holiness as we flee from sin. I'll say it again. Walking in wisdom implies that we strive for holiness as we flee from sin. As soon as we claim the title as Christians, the outside world will focus on us with a microscope to see if the manner of life that we live matches our profession of faith. And when our testimony fails to align to our profession, the outside world is quick to call us hypocrites. Now, I, I, I get it. All of us will slip up. All of us will sin from time to time. We'll let our mouths get away from us. We'll make bad decisions. None of us are perfect and without sin. But, but, but when, that, when that occurs, when we sin, we confess our sins. We repent. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for restitution from the person that we've offended. Yet there are those who will intellectually grab onto the gospel message and think that it's okay to remain in their sins. You know the type. They, they admit that there's nothing that they can do to merit salvation. They are quick to confess that salvation is by grace alone. These are the ones that, that claim the title of Christian, yet at the same time, they knowingly and defiantly and consciously engage in sinful activities while deluding themselves into believing that God is okay with what they are doing because they are under grace. This should not be so among us. God's grace is the mechanism that he uses to lead us to salvation and his grace must never be used as an excuse to sin. I've heard this referred to as cheap grace before, or for the theologically minded folks, it's called antinomianism. Paul is telling them to walk in wisdom, to guard their manner of living, because the outside world is watching. And he's reminding them to not only avoid sins, but to avoid the appearance of evil as well. Paul adds another impactful statement when he tells them to make the best use of the time. When we hear the word time, our mind will refer to a clock, right? We're thinking seconds, minutes, hours. The Greek word for this type of time is, is chronos, is chronos. It's where we get chronology or chronological. Uh, this word is used well over 50 times in the New Testament. However, Paul doesn't use the word chronos when he mentions time here. He uses the Greek word kairos, kairos. And this word is used to describe a fixed, limited, or definite period of time. It's also used to define a period of time when things are brought to a crisis or a decisive moment in time. 
or an opportune or seasonable time. Kairos is used in the New Testament to describe appointed times, harvests, seasons, and signs of the times. In his book, The Holiness of God, R.C. Sproul commented on the Greek word kairos, stating, Kairos refers to special moments that have particular significance. We lack a precise word to translate it into English. The closest thing we come to the word is historic. We recognize that all historic events are also historical events, but not all historical events are historic ones. Historic events are pivotal moments that shape history from that point on. So the word kairos that Paul is using is referring to specific moments or periods in history. Paul is instructing the Colossians to walk in wisdom towards outsiders and to make the best use of the time. Or we could say the best use of the season or the best use of the historic event that God has sovereignly placed them in. God has placed each of us in a specific time frame. Whether we're living in widespread peace or in the midst of a global war. Whether we're seeing unprecedented medical advances in longevity of life or if we're living through a global pandemic. God has called us all to make the best use of the historical period of time that he has sovereignly placed us in. So let's take a quick lesson from Paul and see how he was making the best use of his time while he was in prison. Luke recorded in Acts chapter 8, verse 28, chapter 28, verses 30 to 31, that while Paul was in prison for two years, at his own expense, he welcomed all who came to him, and that Paul was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul further talked about this imprisonment when he was writing to the Philippians church, and he said that his imprisonment has served to advance the gospel so that it has become, become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. You see, Paul didn't squander the imprisonment that God had sovereignly placed him in. Rather, he welcomed guests, he taught the gospel, he evangelized his, impris- his prison guards, and he still found the opportunity to instruct the churches over a thousand miles away by his letters. The Colossians as well, the ones that were receiving this letter from Paul, had their own unique opportunity to make the best use of their historical time frame as they were defending the faith from false teachers. In addition, less than two years after this letter made it to the church at Colossae, the entire city was destroyed by an earthquake. And I can only imagine that the Colossian Christians were reflecting on Paul's words, asking themselves, how are we going to make the best use of this time during this catastrophic event? You see, God uses the church in powerful ways to make the mystery of Christ known amidst wars, calamity, and human suffering. The Colossian believers were sovereignly placed by God in that specific moment in history to bring him the most possible glory to his name. The same can be said about each of us who were providentially placed by God at Fort Campbell, in Oak Grove, in Clarksville, in Hopkinsville. And whether we like it or not, God has placed us exactly where he wants us at this point in history. Paul continues his discussion in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, and he reminds them to let their speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, the Greek word for gracious is charis. It's the same word that we use for grace. Thus, the grace that we receive from God should manifest itself in the grace that we give to others. This is particularly true in the way that we speak because our tongues are the quickest way that we undermine our testimony and bring reproach to Christ. James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote that the tongue is a restless evil. He said that it is full of deadly poison, that it sets fire to the entire course of life, that it boasts and that it stains the whole body. We know this to be true in our own lives, and we also know this to be true in the lives of others that we see. Now, Paul had already instructed the Colossian church in, in chapter 3, verse 8, to put away anger. He told them to put away wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk. 
And he instructed them in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, to put on compassionate hearts, to put on kindness and humility and meekness and patience. And he was instructing these believers to have grace with those that they speak with. He's calling believers to have their speech seasoned with salt. Not, not, not salty like the way that we think of it in terms of bitterness, but, but salt in a good way, as a preservative, as a restrainer, so that we'll know how we can answer each person that we speak with. The Bible teaches that Christians are called to offer a defense of the hope that lies within. Yet we're called to do this with, with grace and seasoned with salt as we answer each person and do it in wisdom as we're making the most of the time. Now I have four applications that I'm going to give you today before I close this sermon. Application number one is to seek opportunities to declare the mystery of Christ during suffering. To seek opportunities to declare the mystery of Christ during suffering. So with the coronavirus bearing down on our nation, our society, our economy, there is a tendency for widespread fear and anger to increase. Some will blame God. Others will blame the government. It seems that there's no end to the finger pointing in times like these. It's as if people think that this pandemic wouldn't have occurred if they were in control of things. But the reality is that control is just an illusion. None of us have complete control over the situations in our lives, even though we like to think so. This event is a great reminder to all of us that our lives are finite. We are but mortal beings. Christians, however, should have a different outlook on the matters of life and death because our Redeemer has us securely in his hands, and we look forward with anticipation to the blessed hope of eternity with him. And rather than feed into the negativity and fear that the world has, Christians should be the ones with the greatest hope of all. Because our hope is in the one who conquered death. It's not in our health, it's not in our jobs, and it's not in our government. And if you are a born-again Christian, I want to remind you that we could lose everything today, and we would still be the richest people on this planet, because our promises are secure in Christ. Now, knowing all of this, we should ask ourselves a few questions. First question is, how am I reacting to this current frenzy? Am I acting like the world? Am I more concerned with stockpiling toilet paper and long shelf, life, long shelf life foods than I am with declaring the mystery of Christ? Second question, does my testimony showcase the fact that I possess a hope in Christ that transcends all understanding? If we look just like the world, then we are failing. Third question, Will the lost world look at our lives and ask, how on earth did they have so much peace when everything is falling apart? You see, when the world sees the hope and peace that we possess, we will have an amazing opening and an opportunity to share the mystery of Christ with them. So we should seek opportunities to declare this mystery. Application number two is to walk in wisdom because the world is watching how we respond. Walk in wisdom. Now, I'm preaching to myself here just as much as I am talking to you, because I have to guard my own life. Whether we like it or not, during times like these, people are watching our every move. While it may seem funny to joke about the coronavirus at work and on the internet, I would caution everybody that this may be the wrong time to be careless with our words. People right now are going through real struggles. Jobs will be lost. Investments will crumble. Houses may be lost. People may, may even die. They are dying. So we should walk in wisdom and not be careless. Let's guard our tongues. Let's guard our finger strokes and the keyboard, keyboard and not come off as heartless and insensitive. Jokes are funny and all. I love to joke. But before we say something dumb, we should consider if it's the right time, if it's the right audience, and most importantly, whether or not it brings glory to God. We should be careful to live in a manner that allows the gospel to spread rather than turning people away because we're being careless. Third application 
is to make the best use of the time. We are watching history unfold before us. So we're in a historic moment right now where things are changing at a rapid pace. Everything that seems certain one month ago is now on shaky ground. We cannot lose sight of the fact that there will be countless opportunities to serve the Lord during this period of harvest. People will be looking for answers. People will be looking for hope. People will be looking for a solid foundation where they can plant their confidence. The only foundation that I know is Christ. We cannot be apathetic right now. We must make the best use of the time and point the hopeless to the one who offers eternal hope, Jesus Christ. We must make the best use of this time, this historical period. Final application, application number four, is that we serve an almighty God, remain steadfast in prayer. Now we can all take a lesson from Paul's prayer. He was in prison. He was not praying for his freedoms or comfort. Rather, Paul was praying that God would glorify himself through that situation, that he would open up a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. It's wise for us right now to pray that God would remove the coronavirus. Absolutely. Yet if he doesn't, if this lasts for the foreseeable future, we must be like Paul and pray that God would get maximum glory through this event and that the lost would flee to Christ in masses and find redemption at the foot of the cross. So in closing, I want to read Paul's words that he penned from prison as he was writing to the the church of Philippi. Paul said, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, we seek your glory above all. Lord, we rest in your sovereign hands. Lord, our confidence is solely placed in your mercy and grace. Lord, we ask that your word would do a mighty work in our lives and that it would conform us into your image. We pray that you would help us to remain watchful in thanksgiving during these times, that you would help us to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Lord, we ask that you would help us to make the best use of the time that we're living in. And Lord, we offer up our lives in your service. We ask, we beg of you, that you would open doors for the mystery of Christ to be proclaimed. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.